the history of writing, kind of uh, in a cursory fashion, and possibly get into um, the backgrounds of English. I've got it on the syllabus that we'll get into the backgrounds. Um, we'll just wait and see. We may, we may not, because I think I have enough time built into the syllabus that we can do the backgrounds of English um, all of next week and the first part of the following. But again, we'll see. So the origins of writing. Earliest complete writing system in the fourth millennium BC. Now I need to, I need to qualify that um, a little bit. Fourth millennium BC is 3,000 to 4,000. Um, because in the these some of these no, notes um, haven't been updated. I have not updated them real recently. Uh, but if I remember correctly, <clears throat> there was an archaeological discovery four or five years ago. Um, trying to remember where, wasn't in the Middle East might have been in the Caucasus area, <clears throat> where some items were discovered, and the scholars are pretty sure that what is on those items is writing. The only problem is no idea what it means, because they're just marks. Okay? But it's, the marks are arranged in an organized pattern way, and it doesn't look like it is mere decoration or art. Okay. One of the difficulties you run into in terms of talking about the origins of writing is when you make the leap between just markings on something and when those markings indicate some kind of semantic meaning. Okay. Like, you know, it's the difference between actually taking notes in a class and just sitting there doodling on the paper. Because the doodles may mean nothing. If you're just drawing geometric designs, those don't necessarily mean any other than, you know, boredom on the part of the, um, the doodler, okay? But going from those geometric designs to writing words on the page, that's a huge leap, okay? Embryonic writing. Notice, it's not real writing. It's writing in the embryo, okay? Paleolithic age, 25,000 B.C., so why are they calling this embryonic? Well, we've got artifacts from literally almost around the world. Um, that indicate, if nothing else, consciousness okay, on the part of the inscribers in material. That is, it's indicating, one, these people are fully modern human, okay? Um, but it's also indicating that there's something going on upstairs in these individuals' minds, okay? That they're capable, for example, of um, aesthetic awareness. Some of this, you know, in terms of the Paleolithic um, age, look at the caves of Lascaux, France, okay? Where you've got bison and deer and hunters, etc., it may not be writing, okay, but it is definitely conveying a story of sorts. Even if that story is just look, so and so went hunting, okay, that might be it. The next item, proto writing, and I've I've given you a couple of examples there of these two items: the Tartaria tablets from the Vinca culture and the Dispilio tablet from Greece. Now. Neither of these have been deciphered, okay? um, and yet it's pretty clear. <laughs> today, it's pretty clear when you look at this one. You know, you've got this little. Come on, Dave. It's playing with my dog with this today. I'm probably in the battery. Um, you got this little, it looks like an amulet or something to be worn around the neck because it's got the hole through it. But it, then it's divided into four. And on each, in, in each quadrant, you've got different symbols. Okay? Again, we have no idea what the symbols mean. But it's probably significant that it's divided into four. 
Okay. Um, same thing on this one, though that is clearly an animal. Probably a deer, possibly something else. You've got another one beside it hanging upside down. This could be, some scholars have suggested, uh, symbolic of wheat or some other grain. But other than that, we're not really um, sure. Some of these symbols in the Dispilio tablet look similar to ancient Greek. And when I say ancient Greek, I don't mean our ancient Greek, like Greek of the first century or even second century BC, but what would have been ancient to them, far predating Homer. Okay. Notice these are these tablets are dated to 5200 BC approximately. Okay. Um, which at that point, okay, 5200 BC, it would be hard to even talk about Greek, okay, because we we're not even sure that the Hellenic group of the Indo-European languages had broken off at that point. More than likely, they may have, okay, but we're not positive. So these are considered proto-writing. They're, they're almost writing, but they're not first. It's not proto in the sense of first. It's proto in the sense of not yet fully developed or not yet fully there. Okay? Pictography. Okay? It's called the first phase of true writing. Why? Well, because individual pictures can carry individual meaning. So you put something down on a rock, or on clay, or on wood, and you can convey some kind of narration. Now, um, is it as efficient as, you know, Dostoevsky writing a novel? No, because let's say for a moment you wanted, you're one of these ancient quote unquote writers, or even a modern writer, because pictography isn't necessarily ancient. Okay, there are still pictographic languages today. And you want to write crime and punishment like this. How much space do you need? Okay, that kind of gets the point out clearly. It's, it's not efficient in the sense of, you know, utilizing or emphasizing symbolic meaning, okay? This, by the way, as you can see, that's from a cave in Utah, okay? So this is Native American writing. Um, this, uh, again, is from Wikipedia, but this is a pictograph talking about the coming of missionaries to Hispaniola, um, Dominican Republic, I think it is. And if I remember correctly, it reads this way down and then across this way and then down. And you can see if I remember the image isn't that great, but there are a couple of crosses on there and a lot of people on foot, some on horseback, etc. Okay. So pictographic, the idea is developing about conveying meaning in a non-spoken or non-oral form, okay? With ideography, you're getting even closer, because what are you doing now? You're conveying ideas through graphs, or graph themes, if you want, okay? A couple of things happen at this point. Abstraction becomes possible, okay? For example, cuneiform, which is the last thing mentioned there, and there's going to be some examples on the next page. Cuneiform. You can represent an idea of something with using this stylus to create these wedge marks in um, wet clay. But what happens over time with cuneiform, and I, I think these are in the notes, and if they're not, I can probably pull them up somewhere, is as time passes, that image that gets impressed in wet clay in cuneiform, that image becomes abstract. 
so that it no longer looks as it originally looked. It no longer looks like this. Right? That was the cuneiform symbol for an ox. What's it look like? It looks like an ox's head. Okay? Ears kind of off to the side, horns pointing up. That eventually gets turned 90 degrees. That's the source of our first letter in our alphabet. Okay? You'll see that on the next page. What else? Number system. The earliest cuneiform that survives is economic. It's, it's tally sheets, receipts, bill of sale, that kind of, um, that kind of material. Okay? Cuneiform uh, is a perfect example. And you've got some examples here. This is a tablet. Um, cursor dies, marker dies. This is a tablet in the British Library, excuse me, British Museum about Cyrus um, of the Persians. Okay, this is the epic part of the Epic of Gilgamesh, also at the British Museum. I think all of these are at the British Museum. Uh, pretty much most surviving cuneiform is. Um, this is a tablet recording allocation of beer. Now I said, you know, it's economic in origin. And you can, I mean, you can get a better idea with this one of how the marks are actually made. I mean, that's just a fairly flat piece of clay. You get a reed, you cut the reed at an angle. When the clay is still wet, you put the reed into the clay at an angle to make the variety of shapes that you're making, or you draw a line to inscribe it the way um, several of those are included. And if you're interested in writing and such, uh, British Museum has quite a bit of their material online. And there are some amazing examples of cuneiform. When I go to London every other summer, I mean, one thing, I've been there probably a dozen times, but I always make a trip to um, the British Museum. Because in the um, Near East collections, not only you go in and there's, I mean, literally, there's a mummy, and there's a mummy, and there's a mummy, and there's a sarcophagus, and there's a sarcophagus. And, I mean, it's just packed, okay? But you, you then go into the, for example, the Assyrian room, okay? Um, and there are these huge gates, twice as tall as this room, you know, 10 feet wide, um, that were the gates that were at the entrance to the city of Babylon. So when... Uh, for example, when Daniel was in, Daniel, the Old Testament prophet, was in Babylon, he walked right past those gates. Okay? There are inscriptions in, on other monuments, big, huge monuments, um, that relate characters that you read about if you read the Old Testament books of Chronicles and Kings. And I'm just going on about this tiglath Pileser the III's war against Blah, 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 okay? They don't want you to, but a lot of these you can actually go up and touch. I mean, they say don't touch, okay? They might have put some ropes around some of them. Um, no, but you'll see a lot of people going up there because, I mean, a lot of that material, if I remember right, all of these date from sometime between 800 to 1,000 B.C., Okay? And I have that little quote there. I'm going to shrink this back down a little bit. I have that little quote there about how the cuneiform script changes. Okay. Um, the sign sag here, which looks like a head. Notice, turns at 90 degrees. There it's normal. Turns 90 degrees. 
then it becomes this. Notice what you still basically have with this third step. Right there. You've got the kind of the body of the head and neck together and the nose sticking up. And then a huge abstraction between three and four and then all the way down to this. Okay. Cuneiform tablets are still being discovered today. Unfortunately, in Iraq, they're being destroyed by ISIS. I mean, they are literally going into museums, going into collections, and destroying all the pre-Islamic history of Iraq. Um, just last December, they went to an ancient building that was um, known locally, called for over 2,000 years, the tomb of Jonah, of Jonah and the whale, Jonah. And they blew it up. Just totally destroyed it. Um, stage one shows the pictogram. Let me shrink this down just a little bit. Shows the pictogram as it was, sorry, um, this, not any of these. This around 3000 BC. That's about 200 years later. Okay. That's about 2600 BC, so 400 years later. Stage four is the sign is written in clay. Stage five, third, uh, late third millennium. Stage six, old Assyrian, second millennium. And then stage seven, first millennium. Okay, so around 1000 AD is what, uh, excuse me, BC is what this one represents. So about 2000 years to go, well, yeah, about 2,000 years to go from there to there, but only 200 years to go from there from there. Why would it change that much? How much has handwriting changed here, let's say in the United States, in 200 years? That much? Do we start flipping letters and such? No. Why? Because at this point... Writing is still almost brand new. Okay. There's, there is not the tendency to um, conserve. Okay. Or the conservative tendency, let's say, hasn't yet taken hold. There is still fluctuation and variety um, in the scripts that as... Time passes on as writing becomes more and more um, useful and widespread, then you'll start to see the variety stop, okay, and writing become much, much more uniform. Again, this is long before schools or anything like that's occurring. Okay, that's all, keep in mind, that's all ideographic, all right? So you move from ideographic to analytic. What does analytic mean? Okay, you're bringing together. So it's a transitional phrase from pictographic writing to writing with letters or phonographs. That is, graphs that represent actual sounds. In cuneiform, it's not thought that any of these represent sounds. They represent ideas, like the idea of a human head, the idea of a hand, the idea of the sun, the idea of water, etc. You know, that, that one there, the idea of beer. Okay? So, analytic scripts, we don't know for certain, but it's thought they might have developed, partially at least, from something like a rebus. Everybody can probably figure out that rebus. What's that? I, I hate, hate football. football. Okay? So, notice what's happening. This is an idea, the ball. The foot is an idea, but it's represent, that's representing solely sound. It's not representing this. It's not saying this hates football, like it's repellent to the visual, you know, sense. So you have sound and image working together 
From this, probably, you start to get hieroglyphic writing. <clears throat> and I've got poor examples, and I should have made them larger. These are Greco-Roman era hieroglyphics. In other words, these are kind of new hieroglyphics. Greco-Roman, you know, probably 500 and forward in time to uh, maybe 100 A.D. Okay. The tomb of Luxor, however, if I remember correctly, that's old dynasty. So that's like two or 3,000 B.C. Okay. Hieroglyphics first deciphered by Thomas Young and Jean-Francois Champollion in... Do I have... That's not too bad. Let me uh, kill the last one. This was discovered <clears throat> during one of Napoleon's uh, ravages, let's call it, in the Nile. It's a big black basalt stone, stands about three feet tall and is about that wide. And what you have here is just the flat shape that has been incised upon. The rest of it isn't flat. It's not like a tablet. It's a, it's a stone, so the back of it is rough and everything. And what you have is you have a text written come on, in three different languages. Okay? Up here, hieroglyphics. Okay? Down here, what's called demotic hieroglyphic, which is kind of a cursive hieroglyphics. It's hieroglyphic meant to be written quickly, like secretary hand, you know, or um, people don't use it anymore, but almost like shorthand, okay? And then down here is Greek, okay? It's because of the Greek that um, Thomas Young and Champollion were able to decipher the hieroglyphics, because what Young noticed is that I don't think I can blow this up. No, I can't. What Young noticed was that there are you can barely make one out there. There's those are what are called cartouches, okay? And it's text inside an oblong circle. There's another one there, and there's another one there. And what Young realized is that these are probably names. Okay? And so he was able to compare names or possible names here and look down at the Greek because he was fluent in Greek. Um, anybody who is a quote unquote lingu linguist or philologist in the 18th or 19th centuries was fluent in Greek and Latin, probably Sanskrit, definitely German, likely French. Okay, so that's what he determined. Okay, and that there were vowels in those. Pretty much everything else he came up with was largely wrong. Champollion, French scholar who was very young, I think, like. 24 at the time. On the basis of what Young discovered, Champollion was able to crack this. Okay. It was the first time hieroglyphics had been deciphered. What it meant was scholars could now go to almost anywhere in Egypt that had hieroglyphics and start to read them. Okay. The particular name that is in that cartouche there and over there and up there, it's Ptolemy. The same Ptolemy who was involved with Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Okay. 
this opened up a lot of doors in terms of understanding Egyptian culture, understanding Egyptian language, understanding Egyptian religion, why they buried the dead the way, the way that they did, because all the ancient texts were written in hieroglyphics. You know, the Egyptian Book of the Dead was in hieroglyphics, as an example. Okay. This, um, also at the British Museum, if you go to the British Museum today and you want to see the Rosetta Stone, uh, good luck, because there will always be a huge crowd around it. Um, when I first went to the British Museum in 1995, I was amazed because it wasn't encased. It was, it was sitting on its own little plinth, but that was it. It you know, had a little tag card underneath Rosetta Stone, decipherment of hieroglyphics, blah, 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 blah. But there was nothing around it. Okay? So you could go up, and I definitely did, and everybody I saw did. You go up and kind of put your hand on it, rub your hand down it. Now it's in a glass box. It's got a humidifier. It's got temperature controlled the whole nine yards um, inside it. Okay, where did I go? Back over here. So over here on this side, I give you some of... The hieroglyphic. So here's the, um, the old hieroglyphic sign, and then here's the hieratic kind of. There are three kinds of hieroglyphics. There's hieratic. There's hieroglyphics, hieratic, and demotic. Demotic is the more recent. D e m o t i c. I'm pretty sure it's in your book. Um, hieratic is the is the one that's kind of cursive, written to be um, designed to be written quickly. Okay. This corresponds to this sound, okay? Ah. The thing that looks like, a, almost like a spear blade, E, etc. And you can go all the way down. You can buy little things off of Amazon, you know, learn your own hieroglyphics with little kits with stamps and all that kind of stuff. I actually used to use that in some of my classes because uh, they work really well. So you go from hieroglyphics to syllabaries. The first real or true phonetic writing system. Okay? Why? Because you have what is written divided by consonants and vowels. Okay? Now, the vowels are implied. They're not written down. For example, in Hebrew, there are no vowels in written Hebrew. That's why if you ever see, you know, a, a written Hebrew text, the name for God or the word for God in the Old Testament will look like this. Y-H-W-H, -W Yahweh, okay? The A ah and the A sound are not included. What else? Syllabic character, continent, vowel implied, as I said. Proto-Sinaitic script may be the earliest recorded syllabary if that's what this is. And these are the examples of this Proto-Sinaitic. It's called Proto-Sinaitic because it's, it's not the real Sinaitic script that exists later. This was actually found in mines that slaves worked in. Right. You've got the transcription on the left and the item that it's actually on over here on the right. It's kind of following down this track up here, and then it goes off to the side up there. All right. And I've got it. Uh, 12 characters, 16 characters, I think, here, and 12 characters there. Greek. Where does Greek come from? Okay. Comes from Phoenician. The Proto-Sinaitic script is related to Phoenician. So, the Greek alphabet has its origins in what's called the North Semitic syllabary. Um, and I've got a chart 
that we'll come to in a moment. I think the chart is in your book. Um, the North Semitic syllabary, the Greeks called everybody who were non-Greek east of them Phoenicians. Okay? They called pretty much everybody who was non-Greek north of them barbarians. Because for Greek, the word barbar, or the sound barbar is just kind of like wah, 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 wah. Okay? It's the Charlie Brown, you know, teacher, so to speak. So the Phoenicians have this syllabic script, which you get here. Let me blow this up some. <clears throat> You have the name of the graph, of what it's called, and then what it represents. Okay, so this thing represents palm. This represents hand, good, wall, weapon. Notice these are largely um, ideas. Okay, but then they represent these ideas, but notice what they also do. <coughs> They're sounds. This, cuff is k. this, which the name of it is yod, the H at the end always means there's a breathing sound. Yod, okay? Represents, it's not j, it's ya, okay? All the way down the line. So you've got what it's called up here, what it represents in terms of a thing, the letter it is equivalent to in modern English, and then the sound it represents. All right. Now you can look at some of those, and even if your, own, your only knowledge of Greek is you've seen it somewhere, you can look at something like that and say, that's a delta. And it is. Okay. A lot of these, you know, that's like a... Epsilon. A lot of these letter forms are not changed very much by the Greeks because the Greeks take those systems or take that system and they adopt it and they adapt it. For example, they have symbols here that the Greeks don't have. That is, they have symbols for sounds that Greek doesn't have. So what the Greeks do is they take those symbols for sounds that the Greeks don't have and they use it for sounds that the Greeks do have. Vowels. Because notice what isn't included in here. Okay, this has A, but it's probably beginning with a H sound. So the Greeks take them and modify. They adopt sound or they adopt letters that aren't being used, so to speak, and they have those represent Greek vowels. They change the arrangement of the letters. Okay. They add new symbols for sounds that Greek has that Phoenician did not have. You know, we look at something like this, for example, and we say it's phi. Not for the Greeks. For the Greeks, it's more pi. Okay. Or chi. Psi. Psi. And then the Greeks also changed the direction of writing. Because in the Semitic syllabary, you would read from right to left, as is still done in modern Hebrew and in modern Arabic. Okay, because Arabic also descends from ultimately the Semitic writing system. What the Greeks did, again, because they're they're trying to be efficient. They made it so that you could write from left to right, or let's, let's start with the Semitic way, from right to left, and then rather than go back to the beginning of the right-hand column on the next line, just go from right to left, go down a line, and go left to right. Go down a line, go right to left, go down a line. It's called bustrophodon. It means as the ox turns. So they began writing as the ox turns. Think about this for a moment in terms of reading. How efficient would that be? What do you have to do now when you read? You have to start over at the other side. Like, if you've ever used an old manual typewriter, 
You're typing on along, and then what do you have to do? You have to hit the carriage to make it go back over so that you can start at the beginning. If you could read in this Boustrophodon pattern, it would speed up reading. Only the problem for us today is what would we have to learn to do? We'd have to learn to write that way. Okay? Which, frankly, I'm too old to learn that. So, here's the Greek alphabet. And even notice, I, didn't, I don't think I had it earlier on the notes. It's in your book. And keep in mind, these are kind of a summary of what you'll see in the book. What was this called in the Semitic syllabary? Aleph. Okay? And this was Beth. Aleph and Beth. But the Aleph actually began the real letter has like um, an apostrophe before it because it symbols a palatal hard sound at the roof of the mouth, like a well, Greek didn't have that. Okay? So all they did was they removed that little like apostrophe at the top and they kept the symbol down at the that was after that um, mark. Changed it to alpha. Okay? And then beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Your book talks about what does epsilon mean? It, it means E stripped bare. It doesn't have what? It doesn't have the sound that Greek had at the beginning of it. For the Greek, it was hita, or the um, Phoenician, sorry. On down, almost any standard dictionary will give you the development of the alphabet. It'll show you the Phoenician, it'll show you the Greek, it'll show you the Latin, and it'll show you um, the European that develops out of that. I'm going to put a thing, a, uh, a chart on the website. You can follow it more clearly and see how it develops then into Cyrillic, okay, the alphabet of Russia, for example, which is based off of Greek, not Latin. Any questions so far? Okay, Romans. I've got to that the Etruscans borrow and adapt the Greek alphabet. There's some um, speculation that that may not be quite so, but if you look at Etruscan, and again, with the internet, you can pull it up. If you look at Etruscan, it's pretty clear that some of the Etruscan symbols have got to be based on Greek. They couldn't arise at the same time. And Etruscan does come later than um, Greek. The Etruscans were in Italy before the Romans. Okay, the Etruscans were the people that the Romans came in kind of on top of, let's say. Well, what do the Romans do? They draw distinctions between Greek sounds, for example, between k and g, because the Greeks used the gamma, okay, uh, where is it, right there, for both g and k, okay, which is why you can go to England today, and you can see it on inscriptions, you can see it at colleges, but you'll see names like this. They're both pronounced. In the case of Cambridge, England, University, keys. I know, how in the world do you get keys from that? It looks like Gaius and Caius, but it's in Cambridge, it's keys. Um, so they, the Romans draw a distinction between these two sounds, and they take that gamma up here, okay, which was originally just for k in, in Latin, and they modify it. Notice what they do. If you look down here at the G, you've essentially got the gamma right there. Okay? Follow the this, go over, and go straight down. All they do... So they make the little loop up and come over. That's how it becomes 
to sound or to represent the sound g. The I and the J, the J is never used as j in Latin. Okay. Similarly, this in Latin is never s. It's not the Boston Celtics. It's the Celtics. Always. It's not Cicero. It's Cicero. It's not Caesar. It's Kaiser. It's actually Kaiser. As in German, the Kaiser. It's almost the exact um, pronunciation. Okay? And they come, they differentiate and invent some of these other letters, which we're not going to go into a great deal. Yes? I'm confused at what gamma is. is that, oh, okay. So is that where they added like the parts of the G, the G to make the... Yeah, the Romans, the Romans added this part, this little ascender here, okay, okay. for that to distinguish between the K and the G. Oh, I forgot I included it on here. So here you have the full development of the alphabet. Proto-Canaanite, over here, this is Semitic, okay? Over here, the Aleph for ox, okay? Around 1000 BC, Okay, notice what it's done. I mean, that's kind of this, okay? And then it's turned, and then it becomes, that's Phoenician there, um, Greek Alpha Etruscan, 500 BC, becomes that form, Classical Roman. Uncial is a form of handwritten um, Roman in softer material. Not necessarily, you don't see Uncial Roman um, as much in uh, what do I want to call it? Um, inscription. You see it on parchment, papyrus, that kind of stuff. Carolingian minuscule. Okay, this comes about after, long after uh, the Roman Empire has died, so to speak. Notice what our alphabet really looks like. It's Carolingian. Okay. What doesn't, what isn't included in here, um, what would be nice to have between, let's say, Classical Roman and Carolingian minuscule would be what's called insular. I-N-S-U-L-A-R. This is the handwriting of Anglo-Saxon England. Okay. <coughs> Notice one thing, by the way. With everything from Etruscan through Unseal. What would we call all those letter forms today? We would call those capital. Okay. Their, their actual term is they are majuscules, which means large. Okay. Carolingian, those are all minuscules. Okay, that's the, what's the other term we use for this and this? Uppercase and lowercase. Anybody know where those terms come from? Printing. Because when printing was invented by um, Johannes Gutenberg in the 1450s, we're going to leave the Chinese out of it, they invented another form of movable, movable type different than Gutenberg's. But when printing was invented in the 15th century, and then as it develops for the next couple of hundred years, what you have is you would have a printer who would have his printing press over here, and he'd have a case. Let's say like, say this is an example of the case. This would be the bottom part of the case, and then the top part of the case would sit right here. Okay, All those large letters were up here. They were in the uppercase. All the small letters were down here in the lowercase. So even when we have terms or phrases today like mind your P's and Q's, that comes from printing. Because what's the difference in some 
fonts between a P and a Q. And what else? The direction they face. Because often what happens in early hand-pressed books, that little tail on the Q would not get inked. So if you didn't, quote-unquote, mind your P's and Q's, you could end up with a P getting reversed and looking like a Q, or you could end up with a Q getting reversed and looking like a Q. Uh, Q P, sorry. Q looking like a key. So you've got the whole development here. Let me shoot that down a little bit more. All the way down to modern English cursive. Okay. This is showing um, at this point what the Latins add, they go from this to this, to the creation of these three letters. Similarly, from here to the creation of this, the Z stays pretty much the same. The I becomes the I and the J. You know, this is cursive. It's not being taught anymore. A lot of school districts around the country have dropped cursive handwriting. Entirely. What's the danger with that? Well, some of us still know it, and so they don't okay. Know. What is most stuff? A lot of handwritten stuff is written cursive. You wouldn't be able to read any of that. Yeah. It's kind of like a fast writing. Uh, everything before the year 1900. If it's written, it's written in cursive. That means you can't do any kind of, for example, historical research. You can't do any reading of old letters. You know, even, even if you're not talking about historical research, family research, reading letters of parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, all that would be beyond one's ability if nobody was able to read cursive. Okay, some later developments. We'll go through this part. Kind of quickly. Um, writing implements, just real simple. Brush, reed, chisel, stylus, pen. Brush for writing on papyrus or papyrus, okay. Reed for cuneiform. Chisel for stone or wood. Stylus for parchment or a paper. And then the later development, the pen. What does the word pen come from? Henna, it's Latin, which is what? Feather. So the modern word for pen comes from that etymology that indicates, well, that was originally written with a feather, okay, a quill, in other words. Medieval scripts, majuscules, minuscules, we just talked about. A couple of other alphabets. You've got an example there of Cyrillic. Blow it up a little bit. Okay. You can see, you know, the A is the same. Okay. That's a little different. You know, that's the sound, the J sound. And then you have the Old English Futhark, which is runic. You go to Books a Million or Barnes and Noble and you buy books on runes. It's all a bunch of nonsense. Um, but this is largely what Tolkien, for example, bases his runic um, alphabet off of. Not entirely. I mean, he does, he does create his own runic system. This is the Old English Futhark. There is a Germanic Futhark, okay, which was a little bit different. Um, the earliest surviving writing in Germanic is runes. Okay, there's a stone that dates from about 200 there used to be a great big drinking horn called the Horn of Galleus. Um, turn that little light off because that picture comes out a lot better. This is called the Frank's Casket. It's at the British Museum. 
It's about 18 inches long, about four inches tall, and about four to five inches wide. It's made out of whalebone, the whole thing. Okay? Um, all four sides have images inscribed like this, and all four sides have a runic inscription, as does the lid. The lid is not with it. The lid is at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. I don't remember how the two got separated. It's named the Franks Castle because it's named after the British collector Sir Wollaston Franks, who donated it to the British Museum in um, <coughs> the 1850s. By the way, let me turn that back off. Show you what this image is showing us. You have, you know, kind of two different panels on both the long sides, and then on the ends you have a single panel. Well, each of the panels is telling a story. The runic inscription all the way around it says nothing about the story. The runic inscription is essentially saying, "I'm a piece of whalebone." I was cast up by the flood on the seashore, okay? But over here, I don't know if you can make it out well enough. This is Mary and Jesus with the three wise men bowing down and worshiping them. This probably dates from about 700 or so A.D. On this side... Okay, you have an image from ancient pagan Germanic mythology. It's the um, hamstring of Wayland the Smith and uh, his escape from his wife's father. That is, his wife's father cut his hamstrings to cripple him so that he couldn't escape because he was known as the greatest smith. He is actually a god in Germanic mythology. And so he kills his wife's father's sons, um, builds wings, and, and flies away. On one of the other sides, you have the sacking of Rome by Titus in 70 AD. And I'm trying to remember what the others are. The interesting thing about this is it has all of these kind of quote unquote mythological events. And it melds them all into this kind of common um, Christian Germanic uh, product, let's say. <clears throat> printing. Johannes Gutenberg invents the movable printing press in Germany in 1453-54. This Bible is pr first printed in 1456. If you want to see one, go to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., they have one right out in the open. It's amazing. Uh, there aren't that many of them left. It's well under 100. Um, William Caxton is the first English printer. He sets up shop in the mid-1470s in um, London. First English printed book. Dicts and sayings of the philosophers. Dicts just means sayings again. Sayings and sayings of the philosophers. Okay? Punctuation. I'm going to kind of get through this quickly. We can take a break. <clears throat> Punctuation. Developed by Aristophanes of Greece, or Byzantium, excuse me, in 260 BC. Prior to Aristophanes, there were no marks of punctuation. And frankly, even after Aristophanes, for, oh, at least a thousand years, you seldom had people using punctuation. Now, punctuation here doesn't only mean things like periods and commas and stuff like that. What did he do? He developed the system of points consisting of a high point, a full stop or period, and the point on the line, the semicolon, and the middle point, the comma. What purpose did they serve, however? What do you think punctuation serves today? Kind of a way to know how to say things, like where, where one's thought in the incidents. That's 
rhetorical punctuation. Okay? If you write your papers rhetorically like that, or oratorically, that is, if you write like you speak, and I don't mean, you know, using slang. I mean how you speak and pause and go on, etc. You're probably going to have your professors, it, at least one problem you'll have with your papers, comma splices. Because what's a comma do? It's a pause. Okay. A comma has nothing to do in terms of its origins with grammar. And yet a comma splice is considered to be a grammatical error. Why? What are you splicing? Kind of, but not really. Two independent clauses. I went to the store, comma, I bought some milk. Two independent clauses. Both of those can stand alone. So in modern English composition teaching, we say, what do you need to do? Make it a semicolon. Make it a semicolon or put a period or put a comma and a conjunction. I went to the store, comma, and I bought some milk. Okay. When Aristophanes came up with it, he wasn't thinking about that at all. The reasons for the punctuation were for delivery. They were entirely for delivery. Because people wouldn't necessarily read, excuse me, write texts to be read quietly. See, it's, it's now thought that the rise of silent reading didn't really begin probably till oh, after the birth of Christ at the earliest. That reading was read out loud. Reading was not really a personal private affair. It was a public affair. So what was written was written to be delivered, written to be performed if it was a play, for example. None of the ancient Greek plays were written solely to be read quietly. You don't have those kinds of plays written until uh, the 17th century, what are called the closet dramas. Okay. Um, point system gets adopted by Latin grammarians. And then Aldous Minutius, a Renaissance printer, adapts the punctuation of Greek manuscripts. And he invents the paragraph, the apostrophe, the semicolon, the question mark, the colon, the period. So if you were to pick up, for example, an Anglo-Saxon manuscript, if you were to pick up Beowulf, you would see one punctuation mark throughout the poem. And it's a point. It's a midpoint. That is, it's midpoint on the line between the bottom of the line and the top of the line. Okay? That's it. And in fact, the poem is written entirely like prose. It just goes from one line, beginning of one line, to the end. Margin to margin, all the way down the page. 22 to 26 lines per page, without any breaks. No sentence breaks, no new clause breaks, nothing. The only breaks you have are what are called fit breaks, which are like chapter breaks, if you want. Okay? Ancient Greek and Roman manuscripts, it just starts at the beginning and goes all the way down to the end. One of the, one of the reasons that for the development and the wide acceptance of punctuation and the breaking of text into smaller discrete units is the copies of biblical manuscripts, the Gospels, for example. Because the early Christian scholars were among the first who said, we need to make this easy to use. So, for example, what kind of Materials, turn if we have anything around here that would be like this, and we don't. What, how would text be written in ancient Rome? Let's say 200 BC. It'd be like that. 
scrolls. So let's say you're reading Oedipus the King, and you want to get to the middle of the play. You've got to unroll it all the way to get to the middle of the play. So one of the things that happens as a result of Christianity and the writing of the texts of, that become the New Testament is you get the invention of what's called the Codex. Sheets of paper, parchment, that get folded together and then sewn into many pieces. So you have like, these are the notes from last week. You do this, you fold them together, you sew them together, and now what do you have? You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve sheets. And it makes it much, much easier to do what? Read it, to, carry to read it, to carry it around, to find passages quickly. <coughs> okay. Pretty amazing thing when you actually um, think about it. There was just an article oh, three weeks ago. I might have mentioned it in class before. Um, about scholars who are, who are coming up with ways to decipher manuscripts, sorry, wrong term, scrolls, scrolls that were destroyed by Vesuvius when it destroyed Pompeii and Herculaneum. Because um, a library at Vesuvius was discovered, and a library at Herculaneum, and Herculaneum, Herculane, Herculaneum in the ancient world had the second greatest library in the world outside Alexandria, Egypt. Okay? The Herculaneum library was destroyed by Vesuvius. It was buried in ash. Okay? Fortunately, many of these scrolls were discovered, given to the British Library, and in the 18th, 19th, early 20th century, some scholars tried to figure out ways to open up the scrolls and read them, and you can imagine what happened. They become thoroughly carbonized, like charcoal. You try to unroll charcoal, what happens? It crumbles. Okay? So, with some wisdom left, they left them alone until the technology would be created. And we have that technology now. I was at a conference in... Um, 1999, and one of the first demonstrations of this was given then, and it was, uh, the guy was a scholar at the British Library, and he had this stuff on the overhead, and he said, you know, this is a scroll of, and I don't remember what it was, some ancient Greek writer, and I mean, it literally looked like charcoal you would throw into a barbecue grill. And he said, obviously, you can't unroll it, but using mass spectrometry, we can now determine what is written in there. Okay? And the technology has gotten so much better in the last 15 years that they're thinking they, they will now be able to decipher what a lot of these scrolls say. And bear in mind, most of the writing of ancient Greece is lost. That is, we have records that tell us that Aristotle, for example, wrote like 20 different books. We only have about a half dozen that remain. Or that Sophocles wrote multiple plays. The best, the best three that we have are the Oedipus cycle. But he kept winning okay, the contests in Athens. Most of the plays that he wrote no longer exist. But they might in these scrolls. Right. Um, and so the last thing I have here, at least for the writing, I think, yeah, is this is a basic kind of tree of the development of modern writing. Starts with the North Semitic syllabary. Notice I'm not including cuneiform, okay, or the proto writing or any of that. But the North Semitic syllabary, two branches, east and west. The east branch leads to Aramaic. Okay. By North Semitic syllabi, you could say Phoenician. Okay. 
um, or Proto-Phoenician, if you want. The East Branch leads to Aramaic script, which gives us the development of all the scripts used in India. Okay, the, the Arabic scripts and the Hebrew language scripts, handwriting. Okay, the Western Branch, Phoenician, which gives rise to Greek, Etruscan. Etruscan gives rise probably to runes and Latin. There's some debate as to whether the Germanic rune system is a development straight from Latin, but it's got characters that look more like Etruscan than they do Latin. Problem there is we don't know when the Germanic script, uh, the Futhark, actually develops. And then the Greek alphabet also gives rise to Cyrillic and Gothic. Okay. And in a brief, some brief, bibliography of texts. And I meant to bring a couple of these. This first one, the world's writing systems, it's like two and a half inches thick, three inches thick. Um, it covers everything. I mean, it's, it, if you get interested in the history of writing, it's one you definitely want to um, look at. And then most of these are more along the, the um, track of English or British handwriting, let's say. Handwriting England, Wales, it's a standard text. This one is very, very good, reading the past, ancient writing from cuneiform to the alphabet. One of the wonderful things about it is it's illustrated with material from the British Museum. Lots and lots of illustrations. So is... Uh, oh, it's not up there. There's another one called The History of Writing, but it's not the Albertine Gar one. It's a Thames and Hudson publication. Questions? Okay, let's take a 